Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here today. So I'm Courtney Starrett. Um, I'm in the Department of Visualization and uh, for now, and I'm a visual artist and my background is in metalsmithing. Um, I aim to create objects that combine an aesthetic allure, um, drawing people in, and then potentially inspiring, delighting, or even provoking questions. Uh, I'm obsessed with understanding the symbiotic evolution of technology and the making of our objects. I started using the computer to co create objects in grad school. Um, I was introduced to computer modeling and digital fabrication. Uh, I started working specifically with 3D printing along with computer numeric controlled machining. Um, and I've been utilizing these technologies alongside um, my traditional fabrication techniques for my creative work. And I started working with a computer programmer, who, which um, I will give credit to as being part of a, my collaborative art team. So we started working together um, and developed a creative workflow or process, which we call data materialization. Um, so she writes, she writes code, uh, but everything kind of, we, we have conversations, but a lot of it comes from kind of my, my need to combine meaning and objects. So um, the data materialization is kind of a, a term that we came up with because it describes both the process and the goal of what we do. Um, and other people have been kind of working to define what this area of art making is as well. And so there, there are several books that we reference. Um, one of them, um, the Springer Handbook has a chapter on data physicalization, which we're actually, um, the teapot that you just saw is cited in um, to talk about that. And then Alinsky and Steele present in their data visualizations book, um, three categories for data visualizations. And I found in reading that, that we kind of, what we're doing really fits into kind of this, ex, this explanatory visualization, which they actually just simply refer to as, as visual art. So it's something that can be appreciated rather than explicitly decoded. So in thinking about that and what we do and what we do in, in the visualization department and in art, I think a lot about these connections and how we can talk about what we do, but um, how the data is presented to the, the viewer um, is important and has been a question that's come up ever since I started working with this process. So um, how little or how much needs to be explained, and I've kind of gone to different extremes in my work thinking about how much of it is important when working with actual data. Um, and so I also am kind of tying this to kind of the art context and in, in what we do. So in, in my teaching, I teach the first year design class um, here for visualization students, as well as a graduate um, level design class where we talk a lot about the degrees of representation, of visual representation and how it's a spectrum. So the furthest edge being detailed representation that's um, fully depicting a scene, kind of like the Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa, which we're all familiar with. And then um, they present the details of the subject accurately um, and, and it's quickly recognizable. And then there's this, this scale of um, kind of abstraction that we move through. So they're abstracted um, to the point where the subject is reduced to its essential elements, as you can see in this um, Paul Klee. And you can tell this is a human face, but it is um, it is clearly abstracted so that the details um, are boiled down to this, just the essential elements that make them recognizable. And then to the furthest side of that scale, you have um, the non-objective territory, which is as in this Kandinsky, there's no discernible details to link back to a specific subject, its color, its energy, its movement. And so, um, I think about that and I've been thinking about that on the scale of a, di a data visualization. So I see the data visualizations kind of existing on a similar spectrum of representation. And so um, you can look at kind of the numbers, which are still an abstraction in some sense, because it's not necessarily um, the true 
the true, but it's kind of the collection of data in a logical spreadsheet. And then you have representations of that through visualization where the information is presented, but yet still discernible, um, hoping to be decoded. And then on the far, far end of this, I feel like our um, the data materialization um, genre of objects, I guess, if you're going to call it that, are, are in the non-objective category. So it's not necessarily important that the, the data specifically is decoded by looking at the object, but the meaning of the data is embedded in the object based on the process and the way that I make my work. Um, so this particular basket uh, from 2020 is called Equal But Different, and it was made with two data sets of the demographics of the 116th US Congress and steel. Um, so I'm gonna kind of fly through these because I could talk a long time about this, but what I think about in my work, and I talk a lot um, to my students about this, is kind of making connections, making connections to things that are meaning, meaningful. Um, Dr. Molina, um, Molina was talking about storytelling through um, data visualizations. And I feel like there's, there's definitely some of that in what I do. I think about the teapot and how it connects to my background as a metalsmith that was kind of a rite of passage to create a, um, to fabricate a teapot. Um, I've done mine in my own way, but, and also thinking about in this, in visualization, we're in the computer graphics realm and animation realm as well. And so this um, Molina teapot or the Utah teapot is very symbolic and meaningful in those two disciplines. So this teapot that I created um, as a kind of a commissioned piece for an exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York, kind of came about by drawing inspiration um, from these areas from which I am um, connected to. And so there's a lot, a lot, I could give an hour long talk just on this piece, but just to kind of talk a little bit about how meaning is embedded in an object. Um, I was asked to create work that was based on, um, that would be inspired by the colonial silver collection of the Museum of the City of New York. And so thinking about how silver objects functioned in colonial America, my inspiration came from the fact that they're um, they were serving as, as kind of, um, a they had monetary value directly. So there were no banks, cash, um, and things like that. And so families would gift their daughters objects to start their um, new married lives in kind of the form of a dowry. And so they didn't necessarily call them that, but um, so I took this idea of the dowry and kind of thought about my finances um, and my financial situation as it was when I was married. And I used specific financial data to kind of, or representations of that data to kind of use um, through a code that Susan developed for me in processing, kind of draw out this footprint of circles that represent different figures of debts and assets that I had. Um, I then kind of used those to kind of cut so the, the concave curves represented the debts where a repeated value convex curve rip was a positive value or an asset in my situation. And so I started to kind of think there's a lot of um, kind of tweaking or re reorganizing when taking data and turning it into a physical object. So in order for it to be fabricated, um, it had to kind of maybe be slid around a little. I never um, manipulate the um, diameter of the circle so the data is kind of truly um, comparative to the other circles, but things can be shifted around in order to be turned into an actual object. Um, and then I created this teapot form, which was 3D printed in a nylon plastic material, um, which kind of has um, no material or inherent value in um, the world uh, or in the economy. And then it was it was plated with copper, first copper, and then sterling silver to kind of give this illusion of value. Um, anyway, I think uh, there's a lot more I could talk about with this piece, but this is just kind of the piece that that um, became kind of noticed in, in thinking about how it connects to data materialization. So um, more recent work that I've made um, has to do with, with whatever data, so politics as art, which is really interesting. And I started thinking about that. This isn't necessarily, this is kind of taking, taking politics and turning it into art. Um, a piece that I did uh, for um, an exhibition uh, honoring the, or kind of marking the, 
uh, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment here in the Wright Gallery that we had at the beginning at the beginning of the fall semester of 2020 um, was I, I decided to take um, at that time what the 116th Congress had the most diverse Congress in US history. Uh, and so I used the demographic data for that to to draw um, these the series of overlapping circles. Um, and then I went through this process kind of again coming back to my metal smithing roots and to create these basket like forms that um, kind of where the negative space kind of um, is a recognition of how much work we have yet to do, but the whole spirit of this piece was kind of thinking about um, equality in, in gender and um, and demographic uh like you know race issues that we have so there's a lot that goes into this piece um in meaning but but in the end it, it can just be a form that can draw you in aesthetically and when you read about it perhaps um think something of it so i created three of those all the same just to kind of think about how they go together so there's a lot of kind of just design um and art thinking that kind of goes into this work um and then in thinking about iteration and how can you use one design um, in multiple ways, I started thinking about this was also due to kind of a limitation in what I had access to in my studio last summer when we were traveling. Um, we went up to upstate New York and I worked out of my in-laws garage and I took these big flat pieces that I had cut before I turned them into basket forms and thought, what could I do with them? And so kind of thinking about how that can be connected. And these pieces, even though they were kind of thought um, of after the baskets were made, so this was, this was a duplicate piece that hadn't been formed beyond flat yet, um, I was thinking about how um, data is, you know, in this, this idea of being able to decode or understand data and how important is that, um, kind of moving through things um, and creating these iterative prints just kind of as an act of, of creation. So I was transferring the steel to the paper. Um, and I'm, I know I'm nearly to my 15 minutes, so I'm going to move a little faster because I really wanted to share with you my newer work. Um, so I just did a whole bunch of prints kind of thinking about how these are called partial impressions. So thinking about snap snapshots of data and how data is not necessarily fully understood e in even when presented in huge amounts so there's lots of processing interpretation and decoding necessary um so recently i've been thinking about how circles have this kind of um have not intentionally but just kind of out of a way of the way I was working, where we're coming up in my work as a, a shape that I was utilizing often. So I've been thinking about the circle. And I've also been, I recently finished reading this book on kind of climate change and how to talk to people about climate change with this um, kind of spirit of hope and healing um, and thinking about how politics divide and climate change is kind of a divisive subject and things like that. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, and how all these things kind of come together in my work um, in kind of a, a reflective way. Um, and I've also been uh, in, I was watching a documentary with my daughter on whales and we were learning about how the um, humpback whale hunts as a community. They might even partner up with a stranger whale and make these um, spiral forms called bubble nets. And so I started thinking about how my work overlapping circles and how this, I was trying to find a way to talk about climate in my work. And so in watching this documentary, I had this aha moment of, oh, I know I need to make some overlapping spirals um, out of the data. So we took a NOAA sea ice index data um, and converted that into these spiral patterns that were inspired by the, the, um, the bubble net patterns of the feeding hunting humpback whales. Um, I was thinking about how the metal that I was using, the copper or the steel to rust onto the paper and wondering if I could also do that with copper, um, which is another material that will react to the environment. Um, and I was thinking about how copper and, and iron um, might be found. And so I'm digging and doing some research on um, the heavy metal in the ocean and, and, and 
um, ocean acidification and, and heavy metals found in, in oceans that are acidifying. Um, also thinking about connections to art and science and going all the way back to Anna Atkins and the, the cyanotype and the, um, her use of the cyanotype to create the first book of photographs, um, which was considered both an art object and a science artifact. Um, and I've just been creating and making and trying to see if I could use the cyanotype print process um, and also transfer of copper and steel to create some prints. And so I started kind of thinking about also the color scheme that I would like to use if working with and thinking about the environment and ocean um, and the cyanotype and verdigris, which is the copper patina transfer um, could create. And so these are just kind of some samples and experiments that led up to kind of this most recently finished piece that I'm about, I'm getting framed currently and sending off to an exhibition in um, at the Long Beach Island Foundation for Arts and Sciences called Elemental Effects. So working with nature to create art. And so that is, <laughs> that is, I'm a little bit like a minute over, but I try to keep it within time. So that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. <laughs>